All right, episode number four from the 52 Weeks of Reefing came to us is uh, planning a safer tank with redundancy. Uh, this redundancy, this redundancy word is kind of uh, something new to me as far as the hobby over the last like three years, really when we started uh, diving into uh, like controllers as monitors or dual return pumps or all these different fail safes that you can put into a system. What's our core belief though? Core belief in terms of planning a safer tank with redundancy is everything breaks uh, faster in a corrosive environment of saltwater spray. Mm -hmm. Mistakes will be made. Mm -hmm. Plan for it rather than react to it. Everything breaks. Everything will break multiple times. Doesn't and matter the, how much you spent on it. Doesn't matter how much you spent on It'll it at break. all. It will break or require maintenance. I mean, that break can mean it like literally will never work again or that it just got jammed and yeah. needs to, some maintenance. Yeah. But this is the way I think of redundancy. And, and some of you have heard this before, but basically what we're doing is creating an artificial environment for these corals and fish to live in Minnesota when they very much like don't belong in Minnesota. <laughs> exactly. In the same way that Randy and I don't belong in space. Right, and so we'll take the go. space shuttle up. Yep. Uh, we'll go on to the you know International Space Station, and you know what? There's something up there that's going to regulate the temperature. There's something up there that's going to make sure that we have food. There's something's going to make sure that we got get rid of our waste. Mm -hmm. There's something up there that's going to uh, provide us oxygen and get rid of the carbon dioxide. There's something up there for all of these things, and then there's a backup, and there's a backup to the backup. Yeah. And these are things for people that are only going to live up there for a matter of days to weeks or even a couple months. We're yeah. going to do this for ten, years to a decade. Yeah, 10 years plus maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. So we don't necessarily have to have a backup to the backup to the backup to the backup. We but, just need to have a mentality and consider these things. Yeah. So here's what we believe matters most when it comes to planning a safer tank with redundancy. First one is... Redundancy can be absolute attention. There's people that say all the time, I, I don't need the, you know, to buy an, uh, a backup heater. I don't need the dual returns. I don't need this. I don't need that. I'm constantly monitoring my tank. And for, I, I don't know, a majority of the reefers out there, that's not just something, a luxury that they have. But, it, but if you do have the ability to monitor your tank with absolute attention, that can be your redundancy. Actually, I'm going to go one step farther than it can be. It might be the best redundancy. Almost, Just right? constant eye on if it. If you are the type of person that is going to be super duper in tank, tune with your tank, you're going to watch it all the time. Mm. You have a pulse on everything that's going on. That might actually be one of the best redundancies is the human being's absolute attention. Yeah. Right? Okay, well, that's just like one portion of the pie, though. Like, there's so many people that aren't going to live up to that standard, uh, and they will all fail if that's <laughs> the case. You know, so uh, uh, another thing that I believe that matters in that spirit, probably the first one, is dual thermostats, dual relays, uh, relays for your heater. Yes. Heater, most likely thing in the long run to nuke the whole tank. You to come home one day and just say, Oh, crap. Yeah. You know, probably worse than that. <laughs> uh, and just, it's over. The ride is done. You get off. The original thing is winning's easy, not losing is the hard part. Yeah. Uh, you just lost you because just... you didn't plan for the heater, right? So dual, dual thermostats, dual relays, uh, that's like... Instead of putting two heaters on one controller, separating them out to two controllers. So now I have one piece that can fail here uh, and one piece that can fail here. The likelihood of both of them failing at the exact same time at the exact same moment, very, very low. And we're choosing higher paths of percentage of success here. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what I would say is if I bought like a Phoenix heater, mm -hmm. it has its own thermostat, it has its own temperature probe, and it has uh, its own relay or triac turning the thing on and off, right? Yeah. 
I'm going to plug that one into another one, you know, being there's all kinds of them. Uh, like Auto Aqua has this little cube that just kind of automatically turns off at 83 uh, or yeah, something. That's true. Plug it in there. You don't even have to set it up. Yep. Uh, you could pick something like the Ranco. You can mm -hmm. pick something like an Apex. You can pick something like a GHL. You can pick, uh, uh, you know, all kinds of different, you know, controllers that JBJ makes one. But you plug one into another one. Yep. Uh, and now you are protecting the tank proper from the thing getting stuck on. So off is... Uh, you got some you can, time. You got some, a pretty good amount of time yeah. before things go totally haywire. On, bad, bad, bad news. And the, the nature of it is, is Soup. in there, they're turned on and off a million times a year. And eventually the things get arced and they stay on for good. Uh, happens all the time. You can just choose whether or not you want it to happen to you. Oof. All right. We also believe that matters most. We just talked about this one, and I'll double down on it. Dual return pumps. It's the heart. It, 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 why not two hearts? Two hearts is better than one when it, the life depends on it, right? If we're just waiting around for the thing to break, uh, low percentage outcome. Yeah. Like, I have to notice it. So having two allows uh, for connecting all the life support, all the things for this space shuttle, to the uh, habitat in which the astronauts or the uh, <laughs> corals and fish live. Exactly. All right. Another one is an electricity backup solution. So like backup battery all the way to backup home generator. There can be so many things here. Uh, and the right answer is like look around your neighborhood and you know kind of ask your neighbors how often the power goes out if you don't already know. I will say... Most people that I've talked to have never had a power outage that lasted more than a day or so. Yeah, I, had, right? I can't, I've never experienced one. Most of them are like eight hours. And so if you live in a heavily populated area that doesn't have like, you know, a lot of trees, or if the power lines are buried, really probably not a huge issue for mm -hmm. you. If you can go down your street and see all the trees hitting all of the lines, and you're in a low density area, <laughs> uh, you're, you got your ear in for it. Yeah. Because not only are those trees in a storm eventually gonna take those things out, but also in a low density area, you're the last. And my knowledge on this, at least in Minnesota, is when uh, the power goes out, the power company prioritizes each fix by how many people it will benefit. Mm. So if you live in an apartment building across the street from four other apartment buildings, you're first. <laughs> if you live out in the middle of nowhere and there's only five houses uh, on the block, uh, you are dead last, man. It might be three <laughs> weeks before you get power again. So uh, you know, think about those things. And so if you're a short-term power outage person, cover this one for sure, because this is the most common one uh, out there. And it's it's just a battery backup for uh, mm. uh, your pump, you know, like for uh, your, you know, airflow because, or the water flow, because gas exchange, you know, and suffocating the fish is the primary concern here. Yeah. I mean, and like once one goes, they all go. And it happens quick. Right? Yeah. As soon as the power's like, off and the water stops flowing, talk about buildup. And stuff starts dying and the corals start going with it. Yeah. So uh, it goes pretty quick. So, uh, you know, by quick, like it actually doesn't have a lot. Nothing really happens until it all happens. Yeah. You know, and so uh, you might feel like, oh, I had power outage for that long. That's fine. You know, you were probably just one hour away from some terrible. <laughs> so uh, there's also like fit your budget because they have like those little pen plaques or I, I don't know which ones we sell now, but they're little mm. uh, battery operated uh, air, oh, stone air stones yeah. driven things. And so, you know, these things are 15 bucks. They plug in the wall, they have batteries in them. And the, and the moment the power goes out, it starts bubbling air stones in it. And the fish for the most part are kind of smart and they'll end up huddling around the air stone. Mm. This is what I would call the bare minimum. Bare minimum. Bare, bare minimum, yeah. right? But like, it will probably work for quite a while. Better yet is a battery backup for your flow power heads. You can use those computer ones, but they don't last very long. They're really short. They'll get like four or six hours out We've of it. We've tested it, so I'm going to just take our words there. I, yeah. I, I, we have investigates on that. It was always a suspicion of mine, and then when we did the actual test yeah. on a whole bunch, of an array of uh, those brand new UPSs built, pretty, built for computers. pretty disappointing. It was pretty for, disappointing. For the cost that you spend on them. Yeah, yeah. the conversion from AC to DC, or from, from, uh, from DC, DC to, to AC, AC and back to DC. so much. Yeah. 
Mm. Uh, and so, uh, but the DC ones, like uh, the Vortex have one, Tunes has one. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think the Gyre might yep, have the one. the Gyres have that. Yep. Uh, so those types of things, and you don't need it for every last pump. You just need one to be running, Yeah. right? So outside of that, there's the generator. And I used to not be a huge, huge fan of the generator, but there's a point at which like, I would say, if your tank now costs you something in the magnitude of 5,000 bucks, a $500 generator probably makes sense. Yeah. You know, there's some kind of equation there. You let you guys can figure yeah. it out. Well, and get it before you need it. You know, that's... Oh, yeah, because once the power out, it's like, no, you, you won't find they're, one. All, they're all sold in the three seconds. <laughs> and in fact, if you hear that there's a mega storm coming in your area, go buy it right now. Don't yeah. wait, because yeah. you won't find it. Or when it does happen, start calling states away and be willing to go drive 15 hours to go get one and come back. <sighs> yeah. Just stay there while you're there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, I, but that, that I will say that I in my own home, you know, these things are pretty expensive, but you can mm. get whole a whole house generators that run off natural gas. Mm. I don't know. Like if you're in an area that loses power all the time, I think, you know, building that into the house is pretty valuable. Like one of the reasons we did it at, at our house is because we lived on this little peninsula and uh, the, the power, I was told, goes out for a week at a time. Nobody's like, coming out there. I don't know about you, man. I don't want to live without every couple of years without power for a week. Oh. You know, and so uh, it's just kind of the nature of where you're at, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. But mm. yeah, uh, think about the power outages. Definitely find a, a pump. Uh, you know, the number one pump that you guys pick up is Vortex. So uh, that one hours. has the easiest thing. It runs for 80 hours. Uh, the MP10, we ran it for 80 hours. Uh. 80. Yeah, <laughs> long, long, much, much farther. And then the next thing that will matter will be temperature. And you know, temperature is a, a little bit of a different animal because it takes a lot of energy to keep the temperature up or down. Yeah, true. Right, and so bags of ice will keep it down if you live in a hot area, and bags of hot water will keep it up. Uh, there's other solutions out there that you, you should research, but like, if it got really down to it, and I don't have power, and I don't have any heat or hot water in my house, I can literally start a fire and uh, get hot water and float that hot water in there so this is the multiple day problem and yeah. you're like into crisis mode yeah. management but there are other solutions out there for that type of thing another actually electricity uh, option is those inverters that plug into your car so oh, those yeah. things are like 30 bucks like go buy one of those things today start your walmart car. has them whatever I, I did that actually yeah. at uh, my house over here in Crystal originally. Uh, and we had a, like a extension cord going all the way out to the, my car <laughs> uh, on the street, you know, and it was running just uh, the MJ mods, uh, you know, when the power would go out there. So think about the electricity uh, is a big deal. So planning for a safer tank with redundancy, what we believe matters most, uh, a float on the ATO. And this is... Uh, like float now. Yeah, I mean, either built into the sump, like so the 160, we have a, a float uh, in there, which is, you know, mechanical, meaning that there's not a uh, make, there's not an electrical sensor, there's not an optical sensor, there's not a float sensor, all of these things that uh, that uh, can fail. It's harder to have a mechanical float fail. It's, it's just it's mechanical. Pops up, closes the valve. Yeah, so float switches that sit at the water level, those things tend to get salt creep that eventually stops them, one yeah. high or low. Yeah, both. Uh, the uh, water level sensors, the opticals, they don't fail off very often or, or uh, on, mm. but they get dirty and they fail off yeah. uh, fairly frequently. Uh, so, but like if you just put in those, you know, like what a $10 float valve that, you know, when the water level goes up, it just pushes the valve close. It's just drilling like a half inch hole in the side of whatever container. You can do it in glass. You yep. can do it in uh, acrylic, uh, acrylic. Plastic. You just put that thing in there and now, and don't put it at the water level as the primary level control right, right, right. because then you'll get salt creep in the little port there too. You wanna put it a few inches above and it's the last fail safe of redundancy on this case. Uh, of making sure you don't flood your floors and the tank. So 100%. float on the ATO. 
I'll throw another one here. What matters most is a water level alarm. And I, I, I mean, it's nice if you had the water levels like from your Apex. Yeah, you know, leak set it sensors, off, your alarm all sort of goes stuff. off on my phone, everything. It but can be simple. It can be really simple. And cheap. Watchdog. 11, like 11, 12 bucks. 12 bucks you can buy from us. You can go to Home Depot. It might be buy nine bucks too. at Home Depot, yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah. Say $3. Uh, and it's a watchdog. It's just a little sensor. And then when it detects water, it sends just off an ear piercing. Ear piercing. Noise. Yeah. Okay. So someday you're going to do something to this tank, which is going to cause it to leak. It could be. You know, the burst of seam, it could be the plumbing, mm. uh, soft plumbing tube came off. Forgot to change your filter sock. Forgot to change your <laughs> filter sock. Could be the, uh, like, uh, you did what Randy did and you bumped the, you know, turns <laughs> down and uh, with while you're doing maintenance and then turn off the power and then flood yeah. it all over the place. It could be the skimmers just going insane for some reason, yeah. spraying yeah. water all over. Someday it'll happen. And what you would like to do is know about it immediately. And for like nine to 10 bucks or something, uh, the watchdog will Ear solve piercing. that for your problem. 100%. We have them, but you can also get them Home Depot and stuff like that. Uh, we also believe matters most is a pH controller or monitor. And uh, I mean, pH being one of the, uh, like a canary in the tank, you know, to some degree. Yeah, I didn't really understand it at first. You know, everybody said pH was super important and I just didn't get it. But I later found out that pH in most cases, uh, at least in the cases that I implement, is an indication that your chemistry solution just got jacked. Yeah. Like uh, you're overdosing, underdosing, whatever. Like if the pH starts to go down, the alkalinity probably was going down too. If it's going up rapidly, it's because uh, you're overdosing your two part, mm -hmm. your Kalkwasser or uh, any of those types of things. Yeah. Uh, if it's going down fast, maybe your calcium reactors got jacked. Uh, any one of these things, the pH can monitor, hopefully one that has a noise that tells you, hey, dude, do something about it, save me. <laughs> uh, or a controller that even better, it can just like turn off the ATO pump, turn off the dosing pump, you know, turn off anything. And like, it's even human turn error. Like fan. I've seen people like, oh, this thing needs some calcium. So I'll just turn on the calcium dosing pump for what I thought was gonna be 10 minutes and he then I forgot. It. You did it to this it, one with yeah, alkalinity. <laughs> I, I forget things all the time. Uh, yeah. I'm the spaciest person you've ever uh, met. And like, so like Dave things. here, like when we do these things, we put our house keys on whatever we're gonna do because I need to remember mm. to come back here and turn it off and to get home, I need to do it. <laughs> because you're just gonna forget so many things, but having an actual controller there to back up. I hope I remember every time for the next 10 years. It doesn't work. Oh, yeah. Hope I remember for 10 years every single time is Lower a low percentage. Path. <laughs> low path to, prove next. to success. Uh, next one is uh, consider mm. what happens when anything with a moving part or plug fails. I mean, we hit this at the very top uh, when we said, you know, the most successful reefers are the ones that plan for the inevitable failure. This is uh, the, the highest path to success in, when it comes to redundancy. Yeah. I, if you just look at the thing, and all you, all you'll you catch 80-20 of it right Yeah. There. All you have to do is go, okay, my protein skimmer has moving parts. What happens if it What fails? happens if I unplug it? Uh, what happens if I plug it in and the water level is too high? Yeah, all you over know? the place. Uh, what happens in this case, in that case, and then decide to do something with it? Then so start planning for it. Consider that. what happens with anything with a moving part. Anything with a moving part will eventually get jacked here. Anything. Uh, anything with a plug will eventually get jacked as well. Like anything that like relies on electricity will eventually fail. Everything fails. Get understand what's going to happen when that goes and you're going to hear tons of this throughout the series so you probably don't have to go build all this for yourself right but you know really think about anything you put on there if this went bad because eventually it will for sure 100 percent. i mean that's our core belief everything breaks even faster in a corrosive environment mistakes will be made plan for it rather than react to it yeah but dang uh all right uh visual okay what else matters most here uh, in terms of uh, a safer, redundant tank. Visual, audible, or mobile alarms when it happens. Oh, 
Yeah, so if the tank went cold, I had this happen to me. I have no idea. I didn't know. You yeah. gotta put your hand in there, but how many times am I walking by just dipping my finger in? Never. Exactly. Yeah, you're like, I wouldn't know that it's cold except for stuff is dying, could, which is too late. Could be a week later, I'm time for my weekly water change, and I feel, ooh, that water's cold, and then not even realize that it's been that way for multiple days. Not everybody's actually that in tune that they know exactly what 72 feels like. Every time I feel yeah. my tank, it says 78, and all of my sensors say 78, I put my finger in there like, God, that tank is cold. And then I look, it's like, no, it's 78. <laughs> yeah, so the perfect one is visual. So like for temperature, you can get like a $2 sticker and stick it on there and it'll give you the temperature. And I'm not really looking in this case for it to be 100% accurate. No, it's just but, a sticker. But I do know what bad looks like. I know what yeah. that right orange and red color looks like on the top end. And I know what that dark blue color looks like on the bottom end. I'm looking I want for to be catastrophe. in between. Yeah. It's a $2 <laughs> catastrophe alarm, right? Uh, a visual can also be a flashing light. So yeah. like those lights that we were showing adaptive from reef. Adaptive Reef, yeah. plugs into your apex. Green light, red yeah. lights. Uh, and yeah, walk up. Green light says A game. Uh, red light says help me. <laughs> right? uh, audible alarm. Man. This is uh, like a double-edged sword because like my tune's off, awesome, little alarm goes off and it makes you want to unplug it, which yep. causes new problems. Yep, 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 Eventually yep. use the feed we've, mode. We've all done that. Uh, but uh, what I want is an audible alarm. When something really bad is happening, I want you to wake me the hell up. Yeah, 100%. Right? Get up and save the animals, right? And my phone text ain't doing it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and if you guys wake up to a little buzz from your text, I turn my phone off at night. So, like, well, your your other pets, uh, your dogs and your cats, they can audibly let you know that something's wrong with them. Bark, mm -hmm. whine, cry, whatever. Your fish can't, they can't hear your fish. <laughs> no, they're just down there. Dying. So, you have to do something yeah. about it. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, audible, and then you know, the mobile part is actually the nicest. Like, it's if really it said cool. something, like, like the, you know, weird thing is, like, the CJ pump will tell you the temperature of the tank. It will also tell you if it loses connection with the pump, meaning there's a power outage, Good probably. Know. Good to right? know, since I don't spend, I, I don't even spend, uh, you know, 20% of my time in my house. Yeah, so the CJ DC pump kind of like weird little things built into it. But also, if you have an actual controller, they will tell you that. I mean, to be honest, man, in a perfect world, the heater itself will be Wi-Fi and just tell me that just thing. Tell you when the it's The return off. pump itself will be Wi-Fi and just tell me that thing. I shouldn't have to actually necessarily plug it all into a controller mm -hmm. either. So mm -hmm. in a perfect world anyway. But yeah, uh, visual, audible, or mobile alarms, when it happens, way, 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 way higher uh, percentage path than assuming you're just gonna stumble upon it. Yeah. That's yeah. a terrible practice. <laughs> All right. Next. Uh, another bully, what we believe matters most is, uh, man, an ounce of prevention, right? Uh, knowing what hap or what to do beforehand when it comes to a chemistry, a temperature, or a pollutant issue, having a plan in place, and maybe not even a plan, but just knowing, like, uh, if alkalinity were to overdose, I know what to do. If calquaster were to overdose, I know what to do. If the temperature went uh, went way above, I've already got my ice packs ready to go. If my tank gets polluted, I've got a thing of carbon uh, ready to go. Uh, it's already preloaded. I can drop it in. Uh, I got a massive amount of water on hand for a water change. Uh, knowing how to solve these problems before you run into the problems, way higher percentage path. So I'm going to share a couple of them right now actually. So uh, in terms of what to, new, to know beforehand uh, with chemistry, mm. the mo most common thing will be like we way over or underdosed uh, yep. like uh, alkalinity, calcium, magnesium or something like that. Most likely right? over, right? Yeah, over, right? And so if you know what to do immediately, tank won't skip a beat, yep. right? Uh, and so I had uh, a couple of these instances. One, I had 10 gallons of kelk going to a 90 tank, a gallon tank. I just happened to Google and find the right answer immediately, which is start putting vinegar into the tank, small amounts until you get it down. Uh, in this case, throw the whole idea of slow and stable is the best path, throw that in the trash, right? You wanna get it back into a safe zone as fast as possible because we're no longer talking about stability killing stuff. We're talking about your tank is now toxic. Yeah. It is going to kill everything. Mm. Uh, and so I was able to, I woke up in the middle of the night, not because of audible alarm, but because I started to hear the gurgling of the top off that I had. And I'm like, I immediately knew I just filled it today. Yeah. Uh, and so mm. I ran to it, Googled it. 
And luckily I found that, that right forum, but like, what if I hadn't found that thing and I didn't know what to do, everything would be dead. And, and in this case, the only thing that I lost was some crabs and some Xenia. Everything else, man, made it through that catastrophe. Another one is uh, uh, I, I had an old girlfriend no. that actually dumped uh, a bunch of alkalinity into the tank for some reason. <laughs> I can't remember why she did it, but she called me up, you know, was really, really worried about it. Uh, and she's like, the tank is all white. And I'm like, all right, dump some vinegar in it, but a little bit. And she dumped it and she's like, oh my God, the pH is now 6.5. And I'm like, okay, dude, dump more al alkalinity and soda ash back <laughs> in. And uh, she's like, well, which one is soda ash? And I'm like, well, and this is the stuff you gotta know off, off the hand because you're on the phone. I was like, yep. well, take some of the cows or take one of each. The one that makes a white poof in the water, that's the one you need to add. Uh, <laughs> do it quickly. And then we did a couple of these, but we got safe and nothing died, mm. right? She's like, even the fish, she called me because the fish were upside down. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and they were really freaking out. Nothing died. Same thing here at my Same office. Same thing in the E-170. You walked in, you look, cloudy tank. Been dosing, it's been dosing sodium uh, bicarb all day or mm -hmm. all night long, which, doesn't have that pH. We would have caught it, you know, with the apex or with the monitors, but because it didn't have that pH boosting effect, uh, it just steadily dripped, steadily dripped, steadily dripped. And uh, when you come in, cloud, oh, just like white cloud. Alkalinity is probably forty. We right? we're lucky. We're fortunate enough here in the office to have. Uh, there's a two hundred twenty gallon vat there. There's a ninety gallon vat there. There's a three hundred gallon vat full of salt water, ready to go salt water at all times. That we were able to do a fast, pff, almost a 60% water change or a 100%, almost 100% water change, solved it immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. But that whole point of uh, knowing what to do beforehand uh, okay. or planning for it. So if that happened to you, uh, so in this case, my problem isn't just the pH, it's mm. that the alkalinity, alkalinity is like 40, mm. right? And that's gonna kill everything too. So the only solution to, there's Get no way out. to pull alkalinity out Replace of the tank it. in a fast, if, uh, medium matter. Yeah. Water changes are it. Uh, Mix up that water, blend it as fast as humanly possible, and start your water changes. Yep. Here we happen to have big tanks that can just suck 40 gallons of water out of one of them, do a water change in those, and we were able to change it out immediately. You didn't even see color change. There was nothing. You didn't, like uh. tomorrow, the next day, you would have never even knew it happened because we knew what to do the moment we saw mm. it. We didn't have to do the research. And you already spoke on the on uh, knowing what to do on temperature to the you know point where. I can a bag of boil, a bag of hot water can solve the cold, and a you know some bags of ice or even plastic bottles uh, with water that are ice uh, mm -hmm. can solve the heat. Uh, but having having those things in the freezer, you know, ready to go, or having being able to get some water and put it in a jug or whatever, ready to go, hot water is easier to get, but the cold water specifically. Well, and then if you got hot tank, like if you got a tank that's like ninety six, right? the solution is let's get it down as fast as possible because stuff is about to go die. Yeah, right? if not I, already. Yeah, I mean, like, I want to get this thing back down to, you know, 82-ish, you know, somewhere in there. I mean, I prefer to minimally maintain the run 78, but I want to get it down something reasonable. It isn't going to kill anything as fast as humanly possible because it's in death zone. Yeah. Uh, the inverse is true of too low. So mm. if, if I walk up to it at 70 degrees, Slow I'm probably going to not just fix the heater and let it immediately go back up to uh, 78. Mm. I think I'm going to let it go. Maybe I'll get a little faster to 74 yep. and then maybe a degree every day or yep. something or, or half a day, whatever. Mm. I wouldn't go. But there's a difference between that stability piece and like oh my God, it's so toxic right now. If I don't do something, it's all gonna die. So just have that in your mind. Like there's just like that little bit of common sense that happens in here. Looking at what's going on, like does the stability piece, you know, trump out the, uh, it's all gonna the die emergency right piece, yeah. Yeah, like it, it's been toxic. Uh, so that's the same thing with pollutants too. So yep. people do this all the time and, and you really need to think about this one in a different mindset than most people do. It's the tank all the time, just something happens and you don't really know why it looks like crap today. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Eventually 
you know, you'll come to the conclusion, like maybe there's a pollutant that's got into this tank. Maybe some uh, some copper got in there. Maybe uh, uh, nitrates and phosphates have built up, or maybe uh, the copper that's in my fish food is built up. Maybe uh, your air conditioner is dripping. leaking from the ceiling and down into the tank. Maybe the lotion on my hands. Maybe my kid dropped pennies in the tank. You <laughs> yeah. know, whatever the hell you know thing you think is happening here, and then. What they do is they run out and do an amazing 20% water change. 20%. That means 80% of it's still there. <laughs> you know, like 80% of whatever is pissing it off is still there. And then even if you like, you know, do a 50% water change and it solves it, oh, you should continue because half of what was pissing these corals off is still in the water. Yeah. And if you did a big water change and it actually solved it, change it all out. Yeah. So, and I'm not talking about doing a 100% water change in a single day, even though I have done that in, you know, severe events. But if you do that, start thinking about how I can do 30% water changes, you know, every day or every other day until I get to the point, you know, you do four or five of those things and you're now down to instead of 50% of it's still in there and maybe 10. 10. Yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, a totally different thing. So pollutants, is definitely that now water changes are the best solution to that you can go to your store by the way buy the water uh local fish store or you can mix it up yourself in a big bat uh but you know think about it in that frame of mind and there are some solutions so for big tanks like so uh you know i've seen some big 500 gallon tanks crash yeah well, I don't have 250 gallons of water sitting around, man, <laughs> to do a 50% water, water change. And even then, is it all heated? And yeah. like, it takes a while to heat up a 250 gallons of water, all this stuff. So then there's things that you can use like resins to pull out, mm -hmm. you know, like my knee jerk before I do the water change is always carbon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Super free throw or some, cheap. Throw uh, some carbon in there. $3 in carbon may just well solve your problem. And if it does solve my problem, I might still think about like, well, whatever's in there, man, I might want to still water change it out. Right, right, right. You know? Yeah. Okay. Then there's a stuff like Brightwell has. Uh, that uh, Purit. Purit. Yeah. It's got uh, some resin beads in there. Yeah. Yeah. It's designed to pull out heavy, heavy metals. metals. Yeah. So note though that resins like that are a little bit indiscriminate. So yeah, they're a big heavy hammer solution to uh, a problem but kind of a last resort too, because talking, they're gonna pull out good things yeah, too. Yeah, trace elements, uh, all kinds of stuff that it's might be beneficial. Indiscriminate, uh, all the things that it's gonna pull out. So but if you have it on hand and you're prepared for it and you know what to do, uh, yeah. you're winning the battle already. Perfect chemistry is less important than getting the poison out. <laughs> That's true. You know, so uh, you know, <laughs> think about it in that frame of mind. All right. So some hard lessons we've learned on planning a safer tank uh, with redundancy. Uh, the false security that comes from, it hasn't happened to me yet, decreases your success rates for everyone, or for not just for you, but for everyone who listens to you. Like, uh, I don't know, uh, oh, that, that hasn't happened to me. I've, I've had this thing for so long. Uh, or no, I, I choose this style of uh, equipment and it's just not a problem that hasn't happened to me. Okay, Remember so, what we said at the top, everything breaks. So if it hasn't happened to you yet, you're not only, uh, that mentality of uh, it hasn't happened to me yet, uh, not only hurts you, but every single person you tell that to. It's just true, man. Yeah. Uh, and so this actually is one of my biggest pet peeves because as somebody that has been doing this for a while, has probably like 10 decades or 100 years of reefing between all the people that have done this year. Yeah. Might even be 200 years. Uh, and then 8 million phone calls that I've been part of and emails and conversations and shows. Like, I know exactly what is likely to fail I, because I've heard it 8 million <laughs> times now, you know? And then, so it's so hard for me to see, you know, somebody come out there and say, you don't need to do that, you know, because it hasn't happened to me and I'm just fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, dude, it just hasn't happened to you yet. And like, so be it for you, you're making an informed decision, but like, I'm even feel worse for the person that's listening to that person yeah. and taking that counsel because 
it's a much lower path to success, yeah, you know, and it's not being presented that way. It's just like, well, it could happen. It, I, like in a long enough timeline with enough people, some of the people will be successful this way and you're one of them. Ah, don't yeah, worry about for now. it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know. The false sex, the sense of security that hasn't happened to me yet. So, and it doesn't mean like we can't afford to go out and like put every last tool on all of it. No, 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 no. But like, you know what? Every six months I can solve another problem. Yeah. You know, and just like, don't think about it as I'm going to wait until it happens. Oof. All right. Okay. That's the relation Which to this goes one. to the next one. Yeah. Hard lessons on planning a safer tank with redundancy, assuming that you will be there when it breaks. All you got to do is ask yourself this. How many hours a day do you sleep? How many hours a day are you at work? And mm -hmm. how many hours a day do you sit in front of the tank and would actually notice if there was a problem? It's probably 80, two hours 20, a day. Or 90, and, 10. Yeah, and there's probably days you miss entirely <laughs> or wouldn't notice and it would go on into the next day. So just assuming that I'll just happen to be in front of it and notice when it breaks, low percentage outcome. Mm, solve that. Uh, hard lesson, uh, waiting until it's worthy of protecting versus protecting a valuable future. Uh, it's kind of like the, I mean, this thing, uh, this 160 here, you think it was worth, uh, an investment in protecting back when it was um, maybe one or two frags in it or zero frags in it? It's, you know, I don't know. This one balances between infinite budget and yeah. not, but like, once you have, you Something. know, $5,000 wrapped into this, every, and the corals are a big colonies and whatever, you, everybody will say this is worth it's protecting. It's worth protecting. Is it worth protecting when they're all tiny little nubbins? <sighs> yeah. I mean, future, you, well, how, uh, how much of an investment did you put in the tiny little nubbins? Because I've, I've bought five tiny little nubbins for $1,000 before. Now, now, those little nubbins are worth protecting. Uh, but you know, even if I filled my tank with $5 little nubbins that are now massive, gigantic colonies, still worth protecting. You know, the, the, the analogy I shared with you the other day was actually about like, imagine you are building a house. Oh yeah. Do you only insure the house once it's built? Uh, or do you insure it while it's being built too? Because three quarters of the way into this, somebody kicks over a kerosene, or not a kerosene, kerosene. A, pro, a propane heater and burns the whole thing down. You should have had insurance. It wasn't the house that I had right then and there, man. It's like, I'm insuring the whole thing to the point of building the house of where <laughs> I'm going, not just a point, a singular point of the journey that I was in. Yeah. So I had to decide that the house was worth something to me and worthy Before of Before it was insurance. finished. Yeah. Before it was finished. Before it was finished. So I think a lot of people make the mistake, or I've made the mistake, is, you know, assuming I will get to it at some point in time. And right now it's just some fish and a handful of frags. I don't really need to care about it as much right now mm. as I did once it's end to end coral, in which case it's super obvious you oh, should yeah. protect the hell out of this yeah. thing. <laughs> but the part of it is I will never get to the point that it's worthy of protecting if I don't protect the journey. If I don't on the protect way there. my nubbins. At least <laughs> the nubbins. Uh, <laughs> at least lower percentage pass. <laughs> Uh, next one, a uh, hard lesson here is uh, the overactive <laughs> skimmer. Um, uh, I've, yeah, I could say this has happened to me. Uh, I mean, yours in particular because of the design of the skimmer and when it overflowed. Uh, but you know, an overflowing skimmer not only means dirty poop water coming back into the tank and just recycling, but a lot of times those things just pfft, spit, sputter, splash all over, and now you've got dirty, nasty tank poo water all over the walls, all over your floors, all over everywhere, and uh, that's a nasty mess to clean up. Yeah, so there's a couple of things uh, that like you should look out for, and a couple of them you can just fix. I'll give you a tip right now. Yeah. Uh, if you're a skimmer out there right now, uh, when it gets full, bobbles all over the place like this, uh, it's because the baffle goes down uh, over the internal baffle and the water has to, the bubbles have to like go around it. Yep. Drill a little hole in the side of the, the, the lids baffle yep. and then the air can escape once the thing is full. You won't have that problem. But there when that's go. happening, what happens is the foam comes out of the little holes in the top of the lid and then it's like spraying all over on the outlets, on all of the cords. If you haven't really protected the thing really well uh, from an electrical standard, 
It is a fire hazard now. Uh, and also, like you mentioned, this thing might have three weeks of poo collected in the cup, and when it goes insane, all of a sudden it's going to dump it's gonna all dump that it all nutrients in. Yeah. immediately. It's and those nutrients it. might rapidly turn into ammonia, Ooh, by the way, because yuck. of what, the point at which they're kind of broken down and so easy. Yeah. It's not just dumping your skimmer cup in there. It's that collect... Oh, man, that's just weeks worth of weeks worth of scum and mud and nasty stuff in your back in your tank at one shot. The number one cause of, of that is a uh, instable uh, water, water level, level in the in the tank. Mm. And so the reason for that is in the sump if the water level goes up, the feed pump doesn't have to work as hard to fill it and so the water level just rises in the whole thing and then it just goes all over the place. So there's a couple of times what happens, it's if you don't have an auto top off and you just dump water in there willy-nilly and like I intentionally dump five gallons too much in there and I'll let yeah. it go back down, that will happen. It'll also happen anytime you turn off the return pumps or the return pump Forget fails. Your skimmer. All of a sudden the water level, the tank drains in there, skimmer's still on, going all over the place. So feed modes you can use to turn the skimmer off for a half hour anytime you turn off anything else, mm -hmm. uh, like on your uh, controllers. Mm -hmm. You can uh, use float uh, switches. A power strip, that you know, the stuff that you want off during a water change or doing whatever is all tied on one strip. So you sh push one uh, button and everything that you want shuts off. On the Apex, I usually use a, like a defer statement yeah. too, so that even when I turn the return pumps back on, uh, the skimmer doesn't come on for another 10 minutes because mm. still the water level will actually be really high in there. You know, there's actually, uh, Auto Aqua makes that uh, um, a little sensor or what have you when the skimmer cup gets full, that it will, and you plug the skimmer pump into this little brick into mm. the wall, and it has a built-in delay on it too. So uh, if, you know, my, uh, my return pump failed, but my skimmer kept going, it would, the skimmer cup would fill up immediately, but as soon as it hit that sensor, it would shut off and it wouldn't turn back on until the sensor was clear. I and mean, once the sensor was clear, it would still take like five minutes. The Octopus Regal actually has that too. They have a little float switch yeah. that fits inside the yeah. cup. When it's full, it just turns off. Yeah. Uh, but you can also pull that thing out and you can just actually put it in your sump too. And so yep. if the sump uh, water level ever gets a blow, it'll just turn the skimmer off. So uh, having that kind of built into it is mm. uh, actually nice too. Uh, this one we mentioned a, a minute ago, hard le lessons we'd like to avoid in the future, assuming you'll remember to turn something back on. The first mistake <laughs> I can think of that I made four times before I bought this $12 thing to stop it is assuming I'll remember to turn off my RODI system. Oh gosh. I'm gonna fill up this 50 gallon tub or 30 gallon tub and at some point in time I'm like, I, for some reason, Mr. Spacey here is going to remember <laughs> to go back down there in four like, hours and turn this off. Like, oh yeah, I'll be back down. Oh yeah, don't worry about it. Somebody's uh, gonna invite me to uh, get some ice cream. Somebody's gonna, I'm gonna, gonna, get, go I'm gonna get on a heavy, backyard. heavy hand of Candy Crush. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Like, yeah, dude, like uh, what if they gave me like one of those uh, free hours or something with the extra <laughs> you know, donuts? So yeah, uh, anything can come up in your life where bam. Yeah. And I can't tell you, I think I probably flooded the floor with uh, dozens of gallons of water four or five times before I decided, mm -hmm. you know what, I actually maybe need that $12 float valve. Like, but it goes- Why? <laughs> why did I have to go through that? It, it, goes with, it goes with a lot of things, and that's why we now, like Dave will put his keys on things that we adjust. We put, you know, um, I set a $50 bill on the, on the dose, and I guess it wasn't an incentive enough because I still forgot it, and Dave brought it back to the office. But having something like, uh, that's, you know, Having it do it for having something that does it for you is is just planning for you know redundancy to beat all ends. Like I can I know that when I push this button or when I do this task, I I can walk away and forget, uh, and it's okay because the controller or what have you is going to automatically do that for me. It's going to remember for me. Uh, if I don't have that ability, then something valuable, something that reminds me, because uh, I get in the same place. I'll. I'll come in the I'll come in here and uh, I'll be filling up the brute trash can with water and I'll be like, I mean, just go walk out uh, really quick and get a marker or something like that. And when you come back in, 10 minutes later, water everywhere. Or, or I could walk by you going to get a marker. I'll come grab you and like, hey, dude, I need you to do something. Yeah. And then done. And like uh, two, three hours later, water. Oh, water. And then yeah. it's always a heart racing event when, uh, when you remember that. Like, <gasps> you did it actually. I didn't tell you water. about it. You, I don't know if you remember this, but like two days ago or three days ago, 
you turned on the lights on the 360 in my office. I did. I walked away. And you locked away and never turned it on. And yep. I knew when you did it. I'm like, dude, when you turn that toggle, that he's not going to turn it back nope. off. They were already off. And he manually turned them on. It was it was past five o'clock, and you know, somebody came in the office and was like, "Oh, this tank looks really great." And I was like, "Oh, yeah, let's turn the lights on and take a look at it." Never turned it. I uh, walked away. The reality is, is I might not have noticed too if I didn't remember that night that that you did this. Of of, of all things, I would never remember. But <laughs> I, I, I was like, you know, I bet she didn't turn that thing off, and uh, I went yeah. look. And, and if I hadn't. Those lights could have been stuck on for days yeah, man, before yeah. I because actually figured it when out. When you get in the office, they're on. When you leave, usually they're still on or on their way out, and you just wouldn't never notice it. And that's why, I, I mean, We haven't again, set up the alarms on the uh, on the lights yet. No, no. The apex, we cleared the apex, we moved it here because all the cords are going to different places. We haven't set up some of those things yet. But you could be smarter about it, especially if you, I mean, if you have a, uh, an aquarium controller you and you want to do something like that, go through the task of, you know, I should, I should have just programmed it before instead of just turning on the outlets, just a, a quick little 10, you know, 10 minute, hey, push this. And then after 10 minutes, it'll automatically shut off. Yeah, feed mode, like a maintenance mode, whatever. We walk up and push uh, feed mode A. And because how many of you periodically just want to turn the lights on when they're off to appreciate the tank or show it to your friends yeah. or your family? All the time. Yeah. How often do you figure to forget to turn it off? Some of the time. <laughs> a lot of the uh, right? time. Uh, and so if you just can push it on, it turns on for an hour, uh, and then you walk away and know that it's going to turn off on your own. Way higher percentage path to way success. Way higher percentage path. All right. Next one. Uh, building a fire hazard, water, mist, and alarm. So you, yeah. this is, the hard lesson here is re, come to the realization that this thing back here with all of its electricity and water is the only space that I can think of in life where that much electricity and water put next to each other is okay. Yeah, and highly conductive salt water. Yeah, you're right? building a fire hazard by setting up one of these tanks. Uh, so there's <laughs> things that you should put in place to not just save the tank, but we're talking like the bigger picture, the home, the family. Yeah, so in the terms of planning a safer tank with redundancy, it means not having power bars that are just sitting on the ground and essentially yeah. will cord freeways of water to go right into them. Yeah. Uh, like the skimmer goes nuts, follows the cord, goes all the way down, sets the place on fire. Mm. Uh, and so uh, don't build a fire hazard. And in terms of fire hazard, you can talk about drip loops, you can talk about water doesn't travel up for the most part, and you can talk about a lot of different things. But if you just go and look at it and you say, yep, that looks like a fire hazard, <laughs> then just fix it. <laughs> you know? uh, and then outside of that, if you're not going to fix it, you're like, you know what? Not worth it. I'm going to change it. I'm going to roll the dice. I understand this is a lower uh, trajectory for both the tank and my family and my house and yep. every possible thing. But I'm going to do it anyway. Well, then go buy a fire alarm uh, that are 30 bucks and install it inside of the sump area. So at least you know immediately if that ever happened. Yeah. Better bonus points if it's like a nest that actually sends that fire alarm to your phone and lets you know to go do something about oh, it. Yeah. So you can actually call maybe maybe the thing is your family's outside, you know, like someone can just mm. go and put the damn thing out. You know, it's because it's probably gonna be a smoldering fire to begin with. Yeah. Well, the and then for your 360, we found that, um, well, we have a, a hobbyist who actually services our fire extinguishers here. Uh, and he kind of, was he the one that led you onto the water mist uh, extinguisher? Yeah, we were looking it's at like, all kinds of them. It's like RO water in a fire extinguisher, which is rated for like electrical fires and whatnot. But uh, for, the, for the sake of the tank, this is something that you can spray in or around the area and not be as concerned with like chemicals going into your tank. Like who knows what's in the other fire extinguishers and how that's going to affect your tank. Uh, but one of these like water mist uh, fire extinguishers, like if you have a fire, higher percentage fat. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different types. I'm gonna butcher it a little bit, but yeah. there's like a powder one. Well, that will put out the fire, but it also probably kill the tank, right? Yep. You're gonna spray all whatever that powder is in the fire extinguisher. So, but better than better than better not. Better than your house. Right? Yeah. I mean, I'd rather kill the tank than set my let my house just burn to the ground with the tank with it. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to put it out. There's also like a foam ones, same problem. Uh, there's also, I think, CO2 ones that spray out CO2 and mm. you know, suffocate the thing. The water mist one is actually deionized water. We that are, comes out in a spray. We're all familiar with that. 
Yeah, well, deionized water doesn't isn't conductive, mm -hmm. uh, and so we can spray the deionized water on the electrical fire, and it will put it out, and it also won't add all those contaminants into your sump or tank. So fire out, tank not dead. Win win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a bad idea to have a water mist fire extinguisher around, or even a fire uh, alarm, because you are you're, no matter how you cut this, there's you know, 12 to 20 cords underneath this yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, even if you did it perfect one day, you might pull a couple of things out and not do it, do it perfect the other day. Yeah. And, and like, this is the piece that somebody said to me once is, if you have a power bar sitting on the ground, really it is just a cord water freeway. If you're thinking I have this, don't wait, not a single day. Don't say, I'm gonna get to this someday in the future. Go home today mm. and fix that because that is the worst possible thing, which is the power board bar sitting on the ground, cord freeway, water freeway. In right, there. Water just go freeway. mount the thing up and you'll eventually just kind of create a drip loops I mean, where that doesn't happen. It already looks ugly on the ground. Make it look ugly and safe. <laughs> Put <Yeah>, it out. <laughs> I, I, like there's, there's perfect and there's just not the worst way. Uh, so just don't do the worst one and just you're better off uh, than you were today. I mean, all you gotta just put two screws in and, and move it up. Uh, uh, go that's ahead. funny. Another hard lesson learned here is waiting until it breaks is not the cheapest or the most efficient method. Uh, it's, I don't know, it, there's something so, uh, it feels so wrong about getting rid of something before it's completely dead. You know, uh, it's electronics or whatever. I, I've got a, I've got a clock radio in my garage, and man, I'm not gonna throw that thing away until it just absolutely stops pumping out the tunes. Uh, so, but that's a hard mentality to grasp around the, you know, uh, for a lot of reefers around their equipment. I won't uh, replace a, a, like, I don't know, a microwave before it breaks. Yeah, you know, I won't replace. I, mean, I, I can live without a microwave for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, my washer, I can live without. I can live a lot with a lot of stuff. Uh, but life support, I don't want to wait until it breaks. <laughs> uh, I think about Good. this in you know in terms of like, what if we had you on a ventilator? Do we want to wait till the ventilator no longer works, or is there a usable like a, lifespan yeah. of the ventilator that we should? Repair it or dump it. Like it's getting on that six months. It's still pumping, yeah. but we should probably. This thing's replace got ten thousand hours on. Randy's it. life depends on it. Yeah, at ten thousand hours and eighty percent of the time they fail uh, after ten thousand. Well, we don't have to wait for that last twenty, man. It's actually, <laughs> and when you think about it, you're thinking you're saving money, but putting the whole tank at risk is not saving money. No, it's it's a the wrong it's mentality. The it, it does not materialize that way. No. And most specifically, I think of as the heater. Yeah, heater turns on and off thirty yeah. times a, uh, or a million times a year. Mm. Costs thirty five bucks. Do I really need to get that last six months out of the heater? Like I'm gonna essentially save myself five bucks. Yeah, and and I'm waiting and hoping that I'm gonna be there the moment that it breaks, or. Uh, I'm gonna put in a thousand dollars worth of redundancy to catch my thirty-five dollar heater when it breaks. <laughs> uh, like, Neither of those are the most cost-effective no. way. They're not cheap. And replacing it before it breaks isn't the end-all solution. But if I were to take my heater and just throw it away at the end of the year after mm. it's turned on and off a million times a year, it's a way higher percentage, and it's also affordable, by the way, because it's thirty-five bucks. Yeah. In terms of reefing, thirty-five bucks might as well be free. Uh, in terms of the types of stuff that you have in the tank that you're protecting, it might, might as, as well, well be, be free. free, right? Yeah. So uh, waiting until it breaks is not the cheapest and mm. not the most efficient method. And it isn't just relation to uh, replacing your heater. I don't need to wait until the return pump or the flow pumps are clogged and don't turn at all. Yeah. I don't I mean, have to wait till the moment, like it literally does not work anymore. I think we mean the analogy of the of the car. Like I don't need to wait until my oil is so sludgy or gone that the engine seizes before I change it. Like there is a maintenance, maintenance. to this thing. There's like at least once a quarter, you know, pull that thing out and clean it at, le at very least twice a year. Okay, is there anybody you guys know that never changes their oil ever and their path is just to uh, hope it doesn't break. Well, I'll get through another six months. That is a low percentage outcome. Extremely uh, low. It's the same thing. So in this case, we actually have alarms, you know, when you do the power monitoring mm -hmm. on uh, your power heads and your return pumps, 
they actually tell you, hey, I need maintenance. Yeah, they start using lower, less and, and less lower. power. Yeah, and it's and it works like a champ. I was I actually just put my uh, gyres uh, on the apex with power monitoring in my office, and uh, already, uh, I you know first few days I got a baseline wattage. Uh, here I am like a month or so in with the with the gyre pumps, and they've already lost like fifteen percent uh, mm -hmm. of the power draw that they had before. And I'm looking at them and they're visually getting dirty. Now, at this point, if I was only following visually, I'm looking at them like, yeah, it's not time to clean those yet. But watching the power draw, I'm like, oh, that's 15% less power. That's 15% less flow. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe more. Yeah. yeah. But using tools like that and really solves this it issue. It doesn't have to be hard either. So uh, you can just get a bucket and throw some citric acid in, in it. You know, we sell it in bulk. Mm -hmm. Uh, throw some citric acid in there and just throw your dryer in there and let it run for a half hour and it will probably have cleaned itself automatically and just put it back in the tank. It, it's that simple. Yeah. Uh, and my return pump, I can just put it into the bucket and let it run. I don't necessarily have to totally disassemble it. No. Nope. Uh, you could. It's probably best practice. But if you're not going to do best practice, second best practice <laughs> second. is actually just clean it sometimes. <laughs> second best practice. <laughs> better, better than nothing. Uh, follow second best practice. Okay. All right. So what's next?